Hi, our names are Kennedy and Wendy Pays. We work in Nakhon Ratchasima in Thailand among the Buddhist majority people. And we've been working in Thailand for over 20 years doing church planting. Um, I'm currently taking uh, Dr. Crocker's apologetics class and he's asked me, asked us to uh, explain uh, our specific apologetic approach here in uh, in Thailand, in Southeast Asia. So that's what this um, short video is going to be about. In the West, when we approach apologetics, we enjoy certain key freedoms, such as freedom of religion and freedom of speech. We also function within our particular cultural context, which values individuality, personal expression, and the equal value of every person. We have a long tradition of Western philosophy that underpins our thinking. We emphasize logic, reason, and the defense of ideas and principles. We also have a long tradition of Christianity, which has shaped our ideas of what is good and evil, was what is moral, and what is truth. As to God, the whole idea of God is part and parcel of our concepts about religion in general. In the East, there are many countries that do not have freedom of speech or freedom of religion. Community is valued over the individual. Equality is considered a Western idea. Eastern philosophy has its underpinnings in different concepts, such as circular rather than linear reasoning. Harmony is valued over being right. Truth comes in different and sometimes conflicting forms. There are questions that should not be asked. As to religion in Southeast Asia, where we are, Christianity is considered the religion of a foreigner. So in the East, the apologetic task of the Christian looks much different. Those significant distinctions between our worlds must be addressed. Language is one aspect, but it is actually these cultural aspects that are the greatest challenges when sharing one's faith. We will talk about some of these major challenges in this short video. John 3.16 One illustration of the challenge of presenting the gospel in this part of the world is how confusing our go-to verse about God is. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The Buddha taught that the idea of a creator God is awicca. It is a question that should not be asked. He also taught that love would lead to clinging and suffering. It is not good. That God had a son indicates that he had a wife, another confusing thing for Buddhists. Eternal life is not seen as the ultimate good in the Buddhist worldview. Nirvana is the cessation of self. The Buddha also taught explicitly against the concept of an eternal or immortal soul. All these ideas the Buddha called avicca or ignorance. They are considered unworthy thoughts. So the apologetic approach must be thought through carefully before presented. The idea of God. A major challenge in sharing one's faith here in the East is the idea of God. God is a question that Westerners must answer. This is because the Christian God is part of our cultural heritage. Even today, although we talk about the West being a post-Christian society, Christianity is still in our cultural memory. If you ask most people in the West about God, they will usually think of the God of the Christian worldview. The dominant religion in the West is still Christianity, and there are churches in every town and city in America. When a Westerner thinks about the idea of God, there is also emotion, whether positive or negative. When we consider the idea of God, there are considerations and ideas that we have heard about about this God since we were young, for or against the idea of God. In the East, and in particular Southeast Asia, the idea of a creator God is a strange one. The Buddha taught against the creator God explicitly. He also taught against the idea of the beginning of time, or a beginning of the universe. What he taught instead is that the universe and all life is a product of endless cycles of birth, aging, death, and rebirth. So where a Westerner cannot avoid the question of God, the Easterner has never really even considered it. 
here in Thailand, there are thousands of Buddhist temples, but very few churches. The country is 94% Theravada Buddhist. What this means is that when a Westerner is trying to talk to a Buddhist about God, he is bringing up new ideas that that Buddhist's family, friends, and community will not support or like. Philosophical, uh, philosophical underpinnings. Another challenge is how we think. It has been explained by some that Western thinking is linear in nature. In the Western world, we have a very different philosophical undergirding that predates the rise of Christianity. When one studies philosophy, it is astounding to realize how much of our thought and ideas have their genesis with philosophers hundreds, if not thousands, of years ago. Greek philosophy of 2,500 years ago continues to have profound influence on our culture and thinking today. We continue to wrestle and grapple with these ideas and considerations. Here in the East, however, the philosophical undergirding is quite different. The Buddha was born in India 2,500 years ago, and this is a good example. While Western philosophers were asking questions like, where did the world come from, and why are we here? Is there a God? The Buddha was teaching people, do not ask the question of where the universe came from. This is the truth of the universe. It is from endless cycles, countless cycles. Do not ask about who created the universe. That is awicca, ignorance. While Western philosophers were contemplating the spirit and the soul, the Buddha taught there is no soul and certainly no immortal soul. And to consider the idea was actually sinful ignorance. Westerners are known for their critical thinking abilities. There is acknowledgement that there is a lack of critical thinking skills here in the East. The reason for this is the difference in educational methodology. Educa education in the East focuses on memorization, rote memorization, rather than analyzing ideas. This discrepancy has been acknowledged and many educational reform programs have been implemented to train younger generations in this skill all over Asia. Asians are known for their circular thinking and focus on harmony rather than settling an argument between two ideas. It is possible to have conflicting values or ideas rather than determining to land on one resolution, on one position. Resolution does not necessarily, uh, resolution here in the East does not necessarily mean lack of conflicting ideas. This is a very apparent thing in their religious practices. Harmony is valued over being right. Harmony is valued over principles. Honor and face. Another Eastern value that must be taken into serious consideration is honor and face. Honor and face are more important than any than almost any other value here. Good and even great ideas will be sacrificed for the sake of honor. So an example of what this might look like is that in a corporation, if a junior partner or employee has a brilliant idea, he must be silent or somehow allow his ideas to be credited to his senior if he wants to see them implemented. While the idea of an individual expression here in the West is celebrated, it is seen as a social threat in Thailand. Their social system of one is one of shame and honor instead of guilt like ours. What this means is that they don't have a sense of personal right or wrong, but that what this means is not that they don't have a sense of personal right or wrong, but that social reputation or face trumps it. The implications of these intertwined concepts is profound when considering apologetic approaches. Freedom of speech. We have the privilege of freedom of speech in the West. It is not a privilege that is enjoyed globally, however. In the West, intelligence is practically worshipped. A brilliant man or woman transcends all other, all other social conventions and is given the freedom to express their views, no matter how controversial, because of their brilliance. Not so here. Such a person will be silenced and considered a problem if they begin to encroach on sacred ground. This brings us to the topic of freedom of speech, which is a great privilege in the West. It is considered a right that belongs to every person, but not so here. 
if you express views that are against the government or monarchy or Buddhism, you will be arrested and possibly go to jail, or you might even go to a correctional camp. This makes drastic differences in how one makes an apologetic approach. The function of deity. Although classic Buddhism does not support the worship of deity or supplication to deity, this is the daily practice of Buddhists. Many will try out God or Jesus Christ on the basis or platform of testing to see if this new patron, this new deity, would do more for them than their previous deities. The function of deities is to assist in financial matters, to help them in crisis situations, protect them from danger, heal them from diseases, and give them luck and wealth. A loving relationship with a deity is not something that they have understanding of. It is a strange concept. Equality versus hierarchy. The Thai social structure is highly hierarchical, and those lower on the social scale must defer to those higher on it. This means that in a business or government organization, for example, the junior might have better ideas or skills or abilities, but they cannot assert themselves or do anything to shame or embarrass their superiors. They can privately suggest things to their direct superior, and that person may implement their idea, but they will get no credit for it. Returning to the idea of apologetics, one must always honor one's listener or risk offending them. This will be communicated by words, tone of voice, body language, and facial expressions. So in an apologetic approach to a Buddhist, we do not refer to their own system because to criticize it would be highly offensive. Instead, Christians stress what is offered in the Christian worldview. For example, there is an answer to the question why we do, why we exist, and where did everything come from. We can address the issue of the ultimate destiny of man, and if indeed he has a soul. We often focus on truths that every person needs to know, such as God exists, God has created human beings, and humans, being created in the image of God, have intrinsic value. We teach that God is like a father and that he cares for his children. He cares about them. They are his creation. The classical apologetics approach is a helpful one in the Buddhist context. Starting with God and the beginning of the universe. Using other kinds of apologetic approaches, such as uh, the facts of the resurrection by Gary Habermas, or the documentary evidence of the Gospels, such as what Montgomery uses, these facts have no real meaning for Buddhists. Historic facts can be arranged three ways, chaotic, cyclical, and linear. This is from Giesler's book in page 80. Westerners normally ascribe to the linear, but Buddhists ascribe to the cyclical. Their cosmology is that the universe has gone through endless cycles of birth, decay, death, and rebirth. So the interpretive framework that Giesler talks about is critical. When approaching a Buddhist with a gospel, it is important to remember that their worldview is radically different than ours. On the level of metaphysics, specifically ontology, axiology, teleology, and eschatology, there are significant differences. So where does one begin? Logical arguments will often not reach them. They will say, I am Buddhist. That is a typical reply to someone sharing the gospel. What is more meaningful are relationships, community, tangible love and help, a friendship commitment, often starting from Genesis and teaching about where the Bible came from and who God is, is very helpful. The whole system needs to be explained because they don't have any reference points. It is against all they have been known and taught. NGOs or foundation work has also made an impact in Thailand. The work among the lepers, orphans, education, medicine, rehabilitation programs, for example. AIDS outreach, slum outreach, prison ministries. All these are tangible expressions of the love of God that resonate with Thai people. The need for community is another 
key issue. Community is very important. As mentioned, they are not an individualistic society in the way Americans are. They are in community, and if they are going to make a faith decision, they have to have a community to join. They need to know who their friends will be, who they will be spending their time with, who is going to be helping them, them and who will be there for them. It is frightening to leave one's own community. Community really helps one another, and they work together to, to make it. Like the funeral fund, the village headman, um, the councils and social supports, these are all critical factors of Thai uh, community. So if one becomes an outsider, they lose protection and support. They become isolated and vulnerable. Some interesting considerations when evangelizing Thai Buddhists is that Buddhists believe in heaven and hell already. The Buddhist scriptures teach on levels of heavens and hells. The difference is that Buddhist hells and heavens are temporary. That is, once one has paid for their sin, they can get out. Or once they have used up all their merit, they have to go back to earth. This is different than the materialistic or naturalist. For them, the supernatural worldview must somehow be established. But this is already established in the Eastern mind. 